welcome to Peace Saving, where our mission is to glorify God by equipping local members to make global disciples. We believe here at Peace Saving that a mature believer is one who is following Jesus, one who is being formed by Jesus, and one who is focused on the mission of Jesus. If you're new to our church today, please go by the Welcome Center. We have a free gift for you. We have an incredible opportunity to advance the gospel this week, but we need your help to do it. Get out your phone, open your Facebook app, find Peace Haven Livestream and share this morning's live feed. Doing this each week is a simple way to expand the reach of the gospel and sound biblical teaching to your unbelieving and believing friends on Facebook. Now you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to access our live stream each week as well as other classes and content. Just search for Peace Haven Baptist Church in the search bar and you'll find us. Biblical Parenting meets today immediately following the service in the kids clubhouse. Uh, just a reminder for you parents, make sure you stick around in the worship center for about 10 to 15 minutes. That way it allows the other parents that are not participating in the class to be able to pick up their children. Uh, we'll have food together, of course, immediately following the service. D groups are also meeting today. Um, if you haven't connected with the group yet and you would like to, please just see me uh, after the service or send me an email at jaredhoots at peacehaven.com. And don't forget to pick up your SRQs that are located on the Welcome Center desk, or you can find them in the Church Center app to prepare for those meetings. It's time to talk about trunk or treat. We need at least 20 to 25 trunks. So if you can help us with that, please sign up today in the foyer or on the Church Center app under trunk or treat. Also, if you're not able to come do a trunk, please plan to donate a big bag of candy. We'll have a receptacle in the foyer at the Welcome Center for you to do so in the next coming weeks. The new church-wide reading plan is available now uh, for October through December, and you can find it located at the Welcome Center desk, or you can find it in the resources section on the Church Center app as well. So make sure you pick it up, read the word with us. Attention all parents of those kids that are participating in our youth Christmas play this year. If you'll see Miss Sharon today at the Kids Check-In Center, back there by the Kids Clubhouse, she will give you your play packets. Very important to meet with her today. Our members, today we start a little earlier, so be here at 4 o'clock. See you then.
Yes, all glory does belong to him this morning. If you would, church, please stand with me for the reading of God's word. You know, I've heard it said that um, the rhythm of worship is revelation and response. God reveals himself to us, and as we see him as he is, we respond by worshiping. We respond with praise. We respond by living in obedience to him. And as I think about that, when uh, we look at the scripture passage we're reading today, we're reading from John chapter 15, and we're hearing Jesus' words, and he talks about um, laying down his life, and he talks about how a a friend uh, will lay down his life for another. And we know that because of who Christ is, what he's done for us, that he is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of all the glory. He's worthy of all the praise. And so this morning as we read this text, let's look at it together. John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. Notice what he says about our relationship with him, the relationship of believers to him. Let's read it together. It says, This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I've called you friends because I have made known to you everything I've heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. This is what I command you, love one another. This is God's word. And so today, as we think about what Jesus says to us there, he says that we have the opportunity to be his friend. And when you look at the Old Testament, there's only two people that are called friends of God in the Old Testament. That's Abraham and Moses. And now as believers today, in obedience to, to him, we can be called the friends of God. Isn't that exciting, church? So today, let's lift up our voices and worship him as we have an opportunity to be his friend. God, he calls me friend. 
standing for uh, Meshach Hopper to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us once again to gather together, to worship you, to praise your name, to hear from your word, Lord, and be changed by it. And we give you the glory, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you're going to do. And God, for your love for us, Lord, the love that led your son to come and die on the cross for our sins, to rise again that we may have new life. Lord, the love that leads us into the green pastures and by the still waters, Lord. The love that also leads us through the shadow of darkness, Lord, the valleys that we go through, Father. And even in the presence, O oh Lord, of our enemies, God, uh, you give us opportunities to praise your name, Lord. And so I pray that you would help us to remember that you are our friend, Lord, that we can lean on. That you are the vine that keeps us going, Lord. And that you are our shepherd, Lord, who protects and provides for us, God. And so I pray, Lord, that in the good times we will remember this, Lord, and we rest well, Father, so that we can do your work later, Lord. And I pray that in the dark times we remember that your goodness 
is still great and still shines, Lord, even when we can't see it. And God, that your love for us leads us in all these places, Lord, to make us more like you, more like your son, God. And so I pray, Father, that you would just help us to remember that, God, and that it would be the motivation to do your work and your will in this world, Lord. And God, I pray for anybody in here, Lord, who is in a valley, Lord, a shadow of death. I pray that you would remind them of your goodness, Lord, and your spirit would comfort them and strengthen them, God, and help them to lean on you, Lord, not to run away from you, Father, where they are alone and, and vulnerable to attacks, Lord, but that they would rest in your presence, God, and they would abide in you, Lord, and they would, re would remember that you are their friend, God, that even the things that are painful in this life, Lord, you use for our good. God, I pray you would help us to remember that throughout the rest of this. God, I pray that you'd be with Pastor John as he brings us the message. Father, may our hearts be receptive, God, and willing to change in any way that you'd call us to, Lord, and that we'd be comforted and encouraged by anything that your word brings to us, Lord. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to read this card here. This is from Pam Jester. She says to my Peace Saving Church family, thank you so much for your visits your phone calls, your cards, your food, and most of all, your prayers during my surgery and recovery time. And she says this, and I hope everybody can echo this, my church family means so much to me. Don't y'all like that word family? I, I really like, you know, some people look at a church as a gathering or just a group of people. I like to look at our church as a family. I believe that's what we are. And so I'm grateful for that, you know, and I know a lot of us have differences of opinions and differences of backgrounds and uh, you know, uh, just different uh, personality types. But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, let's just be reminded we are a family. And so let's stick together as a family and let's go through whatever's coming. We don't know what's coming in this world. We do know this. God gave us this assembly. Uh, ecclesia. What is that? Translated church. It's a called out assembly. That's what we are. But we're a family. We're in the family of God. So I'm so grateful she uses that term. She said, my church family means so much to me. And she says, please continue to keep me in your prayers and so of course Pam we will uh, keep you in, in our prayers also want you to remember Joe over here uh, Mimi passed away of course in recent days and we are very sad uh, Mimi always brought a ray of sunshine into our church family uh, just with her presence and Joe I know you miss her Joe I just want to say this about you I've been here for 12 years and um, you had Janice that passed away and now you've had Mimi that's passed away in that time period and, and I just want to say this about you. Thank you so much for how that you have taken care of both of your wives. And I know they took good care of you. Um, and so I just want to say this, you know, just, uh, just to honor you. Thank you so much for how that you've just set an example of how you have cared for them in their times of need. I also want to mention, of course, Mike and Glenn, the driver's uh, grandson, Landon. Uh, Landon has had some complications. And I know that Mark and uh, Amanda would appreciate your prayers as well as uh, the driver family. So if you will, if you'll continue to remember them. And of course, remember Kathy Smith. Kathy's had a struggle uh, for a while now, and they're just trying to get uh, her situation settled. So I ask you today to be in prayer for them. We are starting our series today from Psalm 23. I am hobbling around. The reason I'm hobbling around is because on Friday I, I was in a pickup basketball game and I popped my Achilles. And so I am going to the doctor tomorrow to see what the damage is. And so I'm going to do my best today to try to uh, maintain some mobility. Uh, but it's official now. I am now as old and decrepit as Perry Dickerson. You thought I was going to say Ronnie Collins, but I switched it, to, switched it over today. Ronnie, I'm giving you a break today, all right? Because I'll never be as old as, and decrepit as you. All right, so uh, no, uh, Psalm 23, Psalm 23, and uh, let's, uh, we'll be looking at that. We're going to call our series, go back just a minute. We're going to call our series a calm from the psalm. If there's anything that we need right now, we need a calmness about us. Uh, because there's so much treachery, there's so many things that are going on around our world right now, and there's so much unsurety and so much uncertainty, and I just want us to be reminded of these first few words that we're going to talk about today from Psalm 23. This is a calm that we receive from this psalm. You say, I'm looking for a calmness, Pastor John. I'm looking for a love and a joy and a peace. I'm looking for that. Well, you're going to find it not necessarily just in a passage, but you're going to find it in a person that the passage is speaking of. And so today we look at that, and I'm going to call this, this message today simply this. We're going to call it So Sheep Can Sleep. I know many of you have lost sleep over so many things, maybe even this week. You know, this week, you know, at night, you know, you've laid in your bed and you've stared at the ceiling. Maybe you've gotten up and you've paced and you just wondered, you know, I just wish I could get some sleep. I wish I had some peace. Well, you say, well, Pastor John, where are we going to find that? Psalm 23, look at verse 1. This is all I'm going to read today. I'm just going to read verse 1 today. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. Now I'm going to ask you to do this. Read it with me. Here we go. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, Psalm 23 is one of the most memorized and one of the most quoted passages in all of Scripture other than John 3.16. When we think of John 3.16, that's probably, you know, if somebody said, what's the most memorized, what's the most quoted, what's the most visible verse in all of Scripture, you'd probably say John 3.16. But rivaling John 3.16, I believe a close second, I believe this famous psalm, it would run run in that place. Psalm 23. This famous psalm was written by an equally famous shepherd king. We, of course, know him as the sweet singer of Israel, the son of Jesse from the tribe of Judah. And I speak, of course, of David the psalmist. In verse 1, David wastes no time to identify Jehovah. When you see the word Lord there, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, whenever you see that in the Old Testament, you can go ahead and mark it down. That is talking about Jehovah God. And so what David does is he, at the very onset of this psalm, he identifies Jehovah, but not just as the shepherd, but rather his shepherd. Now there's a difference. He could say the Lord is a shepherd. He could say the Lord is the shepherd, but he doesn't say that. You notice what he says? He said the Lord is, what's that word? My shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. It's personal. And notice also it's present tense and it's possessive. Think about those three things. You know, if you were to study uh, the Islamic faith, what you would find is you would find Allah as a very impersonal God. The Islamic people, they do not consider Allah to be a personal God. They consider Him to be very impersonal. But when we talk about our God, when we talk about Jehovah God, we talk about Him on a very personal level. It's present tense. You notice David doesn't say the Lord used to be my shepherd or the Lord maybe one day will be my shepherd. He says this, he said the Lord is my shepherd. And it's possessive. David said he's my shepherd. Not so much indicating that he possessed the shepherd, but more so, and this is so important, that the shepherd possesses him. It is so vitally important that we acknowledge God's ownership over every believer. You know, as human, belie- as human beings, we often view our Lord so small. And in doing so, here's what we do. We consider him to be one who possibly can't be trusted. And so we don't give him full ownership. We don't give him full authority. We don't give him full control over our lives. Remember what Paul said in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, Ladies and gentlemen, today we are called on to give God full ownership, full authority, full control in our lives. And we must regularly acknowledge that God is our Father. And I'm going to give you a few things here just about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Number one, God is our Father. What does that mean? That means He is the author and He is the arbiter. You say, what do you mean He's the author? He's the author of creation. He is the author of creation and He is the arbiter of all truth. If you're wondering how we got here, He put us here. He's the author of that. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Number two, though, he is what? He is also the arbiter. He is the arbiter of all truth. When God says it, you can bank on it. Somebody say amen. Now, when we talk about God the the Son, he's the artist, and he's the artisan of all that exists. And what I mean by that is this. According to John 1, you remember what John 1 says? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, watch this. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. We need to view Jesus through that lens of John chapter 1 and even Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 17. Our Bible says this, and I'm just going to give you a little excerpt of it. He said, He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. See, what we know is we know from those passages that Jesus brought into existence all that was in the Father's mind according to those passages. And not only did did He put it together, ladies and gentlemen, He holds it together. And then finally, we must view God, the Holy Spirit, as the agent who teaches us the truth. The one who valid, validates scriptural facts by illuminating our minds and by, by illuminating our hearts to the reality of who Jesus is, who God is, how we got here, and where we're going. According to John 14, 26, it's a very familiar passage. Our Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit, as the agent and as our advisor, as our counselor, then what does He do? He teaches us all truth and He brings all truth to our remembrance in our time that we need it. And so when the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, Just keep in mind that it's all-encompassing of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is the author and the arbiter. God the Son is the artist and the artisan that brings to pass everything that is in the Father's mind and in the Father's heart. And then the Holy Spirit, who is the agent of truth and who is our advisor. He's the one that illuminates our hearts and our minds so that we can know truth. So in in essence, the concepts of creation and human and non-human life began in the mind of God the Father. 
made possible and practical by the handiwork of God the Son, and then revealed to us by the illumination and the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. Now David had a very limited understanding. As we read, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David didn't understand everything that we understand because he's writing from an Old Testament perspective. And so as we look at this, we have to have a great appreciation for David and in, his, in, in essence of his, uh, of his view of God. And, and, and I believe, ladies and gentlemen, today, because we know so much more than David knew, uh, all the more we should have this perspective and even a greater perspective of God than David had. David had a very limited understanding of all of this, but you remember what he said in Psalm 19.1? He said, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Don't you like this? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show us his handiwork. So in Psalm 23, as we're reading this, David essentially asserted that because the Lord was his shepherd and because that he understood you know, that God is the creator of all things and those things are pointing to the glory of God, I believe David enjoyed a profound and practical working relationship with the shepherd. We call this a divine cooperative between maker and human being. It's a divine cooperative where the maker is working along with the human being. And you and I can enjoy this same benefit, uh, 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 really of beauty and of cooperation with God. But in order to bring that divine benefit to reality and fruition, we must act on certain truths. You know, again, I'm calling this a calm from the psalm. Today, it might be in your life that you're thinking, Pastor John, I, I, in my situation, there's not going to be a calmness. There's not going to be a love. There's not going to be a joy. There's not going to be a peace. There's not going to be a long suffering, so, so sufferingness in my life. You know, as you look at the ninefold fruit of the Holy Spirit, as you examine that, you think, Pastor John, that can never happen in my life. Well, I want to tell you today, because of Him, it can happen. It can happen. But we have certain truths that we have to understand and certain truths that we have to apply. As we read through the entire 23rd Psalm, you get the idea, and I'm not going to take time to read through it all today. But you kind of get the idea as you read through that whole psalm that David literally believed that the Lord was deeply concerned about everything that happened in his life. I, I, I can't stress this enough. Please note that if the Lord is your shepherd, if he is your shepherd, he cares about what's going on in your life right now. You say, well, I, I think God has forgotten about me. He has not. So I don't think the Lord cares about me. The Lord does care. David has that idea. Now, you've got to follow David's life and realize that in David's life, there was a lot of times when it looked like that God had completely forgotten about David, but God had not forgotten about David. God was working in David's life the entire time, and he is working in your life as well. Every joy, every pain, every victory, every defeat, all of life, all of death, God cares about it. In your life, every pain that you feel, every joy that you experience, God cares about it. Every victory that you have, every defeat that you experience, He cares about it. Your life, your death, your life after death, He cares about it. David seemed to hold within his mind and in his heart a panoramic view of God that was great and wide and majestic. And in effect, David's relationship became more and more vital. The more he saw God, the more he saw Jehovah as his shepherd, the, the more vital his relationship with God became. David understood three very important things about God in this passage. Three things. Number one, God's character. Number two, God's capability. And number three, God's care. Now, what about God's character? Well, God's character is this. My, my life verse is this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 20, chapter 5, verse 24. Faithful is he who calls you who also will do it. That represents God's character. God's character that is that he is faithful. When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Now, number two is God's capability. It's one thing for me to come to you and say, I'm going to do this. I am going to do this. Every once in a while, I watch, you know, I watch Dateline quite a bit. And I'll hear a detective say this, and I kind of I cringe when I hear a detective say this, but, you know, somebody in their, a person's family will get killed, and that detective will say to that person, we're going to catch this guy. Well, you know, here's the thing. I believe that most detectives, when they say that, I believe they have character. I believe they have the character to say, I'm going to do everything I can to catch this guy, but I don't believe we ought to say, I'm going to catch this guy, because you don't know if you're going to catch him or not. But see, when God says something... His capability goes beyond a detective saying, I'm going to catch this guy. If God says something, he means it. He's going to do it. And here's the thing about it. Not only is he promising to do it, ladies and gentlemen, he's capable of doing it. He is capable of doing it. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's immutable. He is infinite in his every characteristic. And so when we talk about God saying, I have the character that I'm going to do it. I have the capability that I'm going to do it. And here's what means so much to me. He cares enough that he desires to do it. 
It's not that he's doing it out of duty. He's doing it out of love. God has the character to say, I'm going to do it. God has the capability to pull it off. And at the end of the day, it's not just him having character and capability. At the end of the day, it's God's care. The Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd, and he cares about what's going on in my life. He desires to do it. He wants to do it. When I read Psalm 23, and I begin to plumb its depths, my mind takes me to another psalm that blows my mind. Psalm 8, 4. Have you ever read this passage and really just kind of connected? Psalm chapter 8, verse 4. What is man? In other words, what are you and what am I? What are human beings? What is man that God, you are even mindful of him? In other words, that you even give a rip. Why do you even care? Why do you give us a second thought? And the son of man that you visit him, why would you even want to be with us? Listen, God's desire is to visit with us. God's desire is to spend time with us. God's desire is to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us. It's not a duty. Ladies and gentlemen, it's out of love. It's out of care. It's out of devotion. God wants this relationship. Now, here's the question. Why? I can't answer that. I don't have the answer for that. The psalmist doesn't have the answer for that. When we consider the magnitude of his telescopic and his microscopic creation, we wonder why he cares so much about us. I don't have this for you today, but Psalm 100, verse 3 simply says this, it says that, that we as believers were the sheep of his pasture that he's called us. In other words, we are his people, we are the object of his affection, and as he is our shepherd, claims us as his own. He claims me as his own, he claims you as his own. You remember in Jude, when we were going through Jude, y'all remember that 15 week, that four weeks that turned into 15, anybody remember that? All right, all right, so you remember throughout that passage, you remember how that Jude refers to uh, believers, he calls them beloved. Beloved, not just people to people, but ladies and gentlemen, we are beloved of God. According to Isaiah 53, 6, our Bible tells us that God laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. I repeat, God laid on Jesus, the Lord, Jehovah, laid on Him, Jesus, the iniquity of every one of us, and He did so as the price for our redemption. You know, we often talk about redemption, and I'm not sure, you know, that we really fathom or really grasp what redemption is talking about, especially when it's talking about our salvation. But by redemption, what our Bible talks about is it means that Jesus brought us back from the slavery of our sin, and because we've been bought with the price of His blood, ladies and gentlemen, we are not our own. We say the Lord is my shepherd, but ladies and gentlemen, we are His. He owns us. He's earned it. He bought us, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, the Bible says, What know ye not, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? And he says, You're not your own. You have been what? Bought with a price. According to Isaiah 53, 10, again, what does the Bible say? It pleased the Lord, it pleased Jehovah to bruise Jesus or to sacrifice Jesus for our redemption, that we might be bought back through His blood from being disconnected with God to being reconnected to God. Let's not forget that Jesus identifies himself in John 10 as the good shepherd who lays down his life voluntarily. Look what our Bible says here. Such a beautiful thing when we're talking about our shepherd. Jesus says, I am. By the way, don't miss those two words. Remember back in Genesis 3, Moses said, who do I say sent me? What What does the voice say? I am. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Now, who is the good shepherd? The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Uh, Look down at verse 14. Our Bible says this in John chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. So he repeats it, but watch what he says. I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. Now, two very, very important things to know here. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. All right, Jesus identifies himself. He says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. And not only that, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And watch this. They know me. You know, I'm talking to people this morning. You don't know him. You don't know him, and he doesn't know you. You say, wait a minute, he knows everything. Well, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about knowing you as one of his own. And you knowing him as your shepherd. It's a personal connection that occurs at the moment that a believer comes to know Christ as his Savior. And so when the Bible talks about Jesus being the good shepherd who lays down his life voluntarily and gladly for his sheep, There's a relationship that is is connoted there. When we look back at Psalm 8-4, I'm not going to pull it back up, 
But our Bible says this, what is man that you are sacrificially and painfully and humiliatingly mindful of him? I mean, that's how I'm going to say it. When we say, what is man that you are mindful of him? It's not just that he's mindful, he's sacrificially mindful. He's humiliatingly mindful. Ladies and gentlemen, he's sacrificially mindful because of the price that he paid on the cross. In other words, he is lovingly mindful of us. He chose us, he bought us, he claims us, he calls us by name, he makes us his own, and he delights in us. And ladies and gentlemen, that's just good news. That's just about as good as it gets. As my shepherd, he makes me free from my sin debt. He makes me free from my fears. He makes me free from my failures. And that's why you and I should love him wholeheartedly today and follow him with the fierce loyalty. I do not believe that the church today, and I, I'm preaching to myself, I do not t- believe that today that we are following him with a fierce loyalty. I believe we are following him casually. We appreciate him We tip our hat to him, but ladies and gentlemen, I believe this. I believe if he's my shepherd and he sacrificed himself for me and I'm not my own, I've been bought with a price, my loyalty and and my devotion to him, we need to raise the level a little bit on that. We need to get to a point, you know, where that connection means something to us. I I pray for the day, and I I believe that, you know, I, I believe we as a church, I believe that we come together, I believe we have great worship time, I really do believe that, but I also believe this, I believe that we could come in with a little more enthusiasm, I believe we could come in here today, you know, with just a little bit more ump to worship God, I believe, I believe we can, I believe we should, now that's, you can't manufacture that, that's going to manifest itself based on what we've been doing with God during the week. It's not just about, okay, let's get into church and let's muster up a lot of excitement and enthusiasm for the glory of God. No, let's do that during the week in our own personal time with God. But as God's people comes in here, it ought to be, we can't wait for Chuck to hit that first note. We can't wait for that choir to hit that first note. We can't wait to have that opportunity to be able to lift up our voices and lift up our hearts and our minds and our bodies to God Almighty who gave himself for us. He's the good shepherd. He gave his life for me. He knows me. I know him. I have a personal relationship relationship with him and ladies and gentlemen that's the greatest privilege in all of the world in all of history and it's all that's going to matter a million years from now that's it it's all that's going to matter and so right now we need to be like the psalmist giving glory to God and recognizing the heavens themselves are giving glory to God the firmament is showing his handiwork as we come together at church we ought to come here you know don't rely on Chuck and don't rely on Pastor John and don't rely on Pastor Jared don't rely on Brother Jared to get you excited about God how about today you come in already excited about God because you've been excited about him all week you've met with him you've communed with him he's spoken to you you've spoken to him you come into the church house not to depend on somebody else to get you motivated for God You come in already motivated for God. All we're going to do is put the icing on the cake. The psalmist, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. David didn't operate in limbo. David did not operate in limbo. David didn't look at it like we can have it both ways. Well, I'll have my world and I'll have my, my, my word. I'll have my secular and I'll have my spiritual. No, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have a secular life and a spiritual life. If you're a believer, you only have a spiritual life, and that's 24-7. It's 24-7. If you say the Lord is my shepherd, you are in essence saying, I belong to the Lord. You're saying, I am his sheep. He owns me. I am forever under his care. I am forever under his management and his administration. Do you remember our questions from last week? Last week we asked the questions. Number one, who is God? You have to answer that. Number two, what has God done? Number three, who are you because of what, is God, what God has done? And now, uh, number four, what should I do in response to who God is and what God has done? Number one, who is God? Number two, what has He done? Number three, who am I because of what He's done? Number four, how am I supposed to live? How am I supposed to behave? How am I supposed to respond to, what, to knowing who He is and what He has done? Listen, to better understand ourselves, it might interest you to know that the term sheep or shepherds or lambs or flocks, they're mentioned in the, New King, in the New King James, which is what I'm using this morning. In the New King James Version, those terms are mentioned 698 times. I want you to think about this. 698 times. And in all of this, Scripture is textually populated with literally millions of sheep by stated number. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, 
on one occasion, the Jews seized 650,000 sheep from the Midianites. Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, he took 800,000 sheep from the enemy lands. King Ahab had demanded 100,000 rams as a tribute from the king of Moab. Solomon offered 120,000 sheep as a sacrifice at the temple dedication. Historically speaking, we are told that some 250,000, quarter of a million, 250,000 lambs were sacrificed annually at the temple just during the, the Passover. So I say all that to say this, throughout scripture, sheep had a great value. They had a great value, but here's, here's the thing that we need to focus on. Not just that we have a great value, and we do in the eyes of God, we are valuable, but we also have a great vulnerability. And I think that God used sheep. That's why they needed a shepherd. Listen, the term shepherd is actually linguistically, it's a contraction of the terms sheep herder. A sheep herder understood firsthand the value of a sheep. He also understood the vulnerability of his sheep. Now, David, I remind you, for all intents and purposes, if you know the history of David's life, David, of course, was an expert sheep herder. He was an expert shepherd. And perhaps that's how David could make such a beautiful comparison here with what he himself constantly did for his sheep and what God constantly does for us. Now, of course, let's be reminded. You know, what David did for his sheep pales in comparison to what God does for us. God works at, at a very high capacity. But let's stop for a moment and let's make an obvious observation. In creation, God seems to have in part designed animals as an education tool for human beings. Because sometimes, you know, say, you know we'll use a simile. A simile is when you say like or as. So let's, let's talk about Isaiah 40, 31. Our Bible tells us this. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. See, throughout Scripture, God uses animals to demonstrate to us how we are supposed to live. Isaiah 41, 40, 31, the eagle teaches us to soar comfortably in the updraft of faith. Proverbs 6, 6, go to the ant, thou sluggard. What we learn there is we learn, of course, the value and the importance and dilig of diligence and preparation. Nestled deeply in the recesses of the minor prophets, though we learn the art of sure-footedness in high places from the deer, Habakkuk 3.19. And then from our New Testament, one of the most popular, I'm sure that you know of, one of the most popular in the New Testament Gospels we see in Luke 13.34, how the little chicks find refuge beneath, beneath the wings of their maternal protector. God uses animals to illustrate life. We have right there the eagle. Learn to live by faith and let the, let the eagle demonstrate how to do that. The deer, how to have sure-footedness. The ant, you know how to prepare. The chicks, how to find protection. But then what about the sheep? As I mentioned earlier, sheep and its derivatives are mentioned some 698 times in Scripture. And I am convinced that, te that, that sheep can teach us much about ourselves. Now you say, Pastor John, what can sheep teach us about us? Are you ready? Are you ready for me to illustrate for you why God uses sheep to illustrate us all right sheep are the dumbest most helpless creatures on planet earth are you glad now that we brought that to light sheep are the dumbest most helpless creatures on planet earth they're not chameleons so they can't change, you know, their, their appearance. They can't run fast. They can't dig holes or climb trees. You've heard of Rambo. You've never heard of Lambo, though, right? They just, they just don't have any way to defend themselves. They don't have any way to feed themselves. They don't have any way to take care of themselves. They have absolutely no sense of direction. Their wool is very bulky, it tends to get caught in the thickets, and if a sheep falls into the water, that wet wool is sure to weigh it down to a certain drowning. Now you think about it, they can't fight, they can't defend themselves, they can't change their appearance, they can't dig a hole, they can't climb a tree, they can't feed themselves, uh, their, their wool itself, you know, is a liability, and you think, man, this is how God describes us. Now I say this because, uh, you know, to illustrate a point, many of us think that we're anything but dumb. Many of us think that we're anything but vulnerable. 
Many of us think that we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we think that we've gotten where we are by some level of intelligence or some level, you know, of competency that we've been able to implement and we've been able, you know, to insert into our own lives. And I just want to remind you of something. When God sees us, He sees us as dumb and helpless. And when you realize that you are that, that's when you are in a good place to have a good, wholesome relationship with God. Because at that point, you will realize, I am completely dependent on Him. You see, here's the thing. You can't even take your next breath without Him. You can't take your next step without Him. Especially if you've popped your Achilles. You can't walk across the room. You can't think a thought. You can't, not without Him. And so that's why that God describes us in this manner. He uses sheep to illustrate what we are. Listen, sheep are clueless. They're paranoid. They panic at the slightest sound. Forests and jungles are full of animals that require no human care. Think about all these animals that require absolutely no human care. And then I want you to think about what a sheep has to go through. A sheep has to have a shepherd to survive. By the way, I think that this right here smacks in the face of evolution. Because Darwin's theory involves the survival of the fittest. How did these guys survive? How did they survive? Well, I got to tell you, they've had a shepherd. I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe in, spo- I believe in microevolution. I don't believe in macroevolution. And I do not believe in spontaneous generation. I still believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And I believe sheep was part of that. And I believe God has had shepherds taking care of sheep for a long time, if for nothing else, just to illustrate to us how much that we need God for green pastures, how much that we need God for still waters, how much that we need God for nourishment. Because a sheep has to have that. Now, y'all know this. Every once in a while, a sheep will forget its need for a shepherd and it'll wander off. What does Isaiah say? All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, right? We talked about that verse a while ago, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep have gone astray. How about this? There, one, one wanders off from the 99, right? And what does the shepherd do? He leaves the 99 to go get the one. So sheep wander off. And then the shepherd has to go track it down and rescue it from danger and from starvation. That's how sheep teach us about ourselves. We cannot survive without our shepherd for very long. We're just not able to do it. There is an enemy and his forces that walk about as a roaring lion. They seek to devour a sheep and they, they steal, they kill, they destroy. What, is, what does 1 Peter 5, 8 tell us? It says this, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil. As a roaring lion, he walks about seeking whom he may devour. Now think about this, be sober, be vigilant. In other words, be on the lookout because your adversary, the devil. Now watch, watch this, he walks about as a what? As a roaring lion. Now, I want you to think about the difference between a lion and a sheep. Who's winning? I got one lion. Who's winning? The lion. Ferocious, vicious, predatory. That's what Satan and his forces are. Now, here's, 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 let's put this in perspective. If I'm a sheep and Satan is like a lion, I have no hope apart from the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now you'll notice it says, we talked about a simile a while ago, like or as. Notice what our Bible says. He's about like a roaring lion. He's not the true lion. The true lion is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But if I'm not walking with him, I've got no, I've got no chance. I have no chance. As a sheep, I have no chance of escape. I have no chance of victory. I am going to be defeated because Satan and me against each other without God in the equation is me always being defeated. Always. However, I have a promise that the Lord, Jehovah, is right now my shepherd. Isn't it good that David himself killed a lion and a bear to protect his sheep. It's kind of illustrative of what God does for us. 
How many times has Satan, how many times has Satan's forces come against you or someone else? And how many times has God stepped in and says, "Uh uh-uh? How many of you like it when God says, "Uh uh-uh? How many of you know this? He says, "Uh uh-uh, a whole lot more than you know he says, "Uh uh-uh. And when we get to heaven, we might just have a whole category of, "Uh uh-uh. And it might blow our minds to know how many times he's protected us and how many times he's protected our children, not just physically, but spiritually, because he is the Lord and he is our shepherd. We're sheep. We're dumb. We got no chance. John 10 10 says the thief comes to what? He comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But my shepherd says, oh, uh uh-uh. uh. Uh uh. I should have entitled this message uh uh, but I didn't know how to spell it. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus, my shepherd, says, uh uh-uh. uh. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Thank God for a good shepherd who died for me. Thank God for a good shepherd who knows me. Thank God for a good shepherd. I can know him. He wants me to have life. And when that thief, that lion, that one as a lion, who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy and to devour, I've got my shepherd who steps in and says, "Uh uh-uh. He belongs to me. She belongs to me. Our shepherd says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. David put it this way in Psalm 23, 1. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. And he says, I shall not want. The word want in verse 1 is used in the archaic sense of the word. What I mean by that is it doesn't indicate that we're going to have, he doesn't say, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm going to have all I ever desire. He's saying, I shall not want. In other words, it represents what we need. I'm not going to be in want. I'm not going to lack what I need. I'm going to have the essentials. Y'all remember when you were, uh, uh, when your kids were younger? Some of you are, are this way now. How many of y'all remember watching The Jungle Book? Come on, people, help me. How many of y'all remember Baloo? I can't tell you. How many of y'all are sick of The Jungle Book and will never watch it again because you had to watch it a million times with your kids, Okay. But you remember what Baloo talked about? The bare necessities. It's just the... Never mind, y'all forget it. All right. The simple bare necessities, right? You know, you can just kind of see him shake. Well, I can't do that either. <laughs> I can't do that either. I can't shake like he can. But, but, but you remember, you know, he's, 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 he's trying to demonstrate us all you need. You know, well, our Bible lets us know this. David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I believe he's he's talking about the bare necessities. The Living Bible paraphrases it this way, and I I wouldn't encourage you to memorize it this way, but I do like how that it's demonstrated. The Living Bible says, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. I don't like the way that reads because it's not as poetic as King James. You know, I like the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. However, as a commentary, I like what the Living Bible says here. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. Now, let's talk about your needs. This is what it's talking about. Number one, your external needs. Number two, your eternal needs. And number three, your internal needs. Number one, external needs. What is that? Well, that's food, that's clothing, that's shelter. Eternal needs. How about your salvation? How about everlasting life? How about a relationship with God? And then your internal needs, peace, joy, purpose, fulfillment. What David is saying is David is saying, the Lord is my shepherd. My external needs will be met. My eternal needs will be met. My internal needs will be met. Not everything that I ever wanted, but listen, everything that I'll ever need. By the way, God knows what you need more than you do. God knows what I need more than I do. We have to trust him in that. Psalm 37, 25 says this, David said he'd never seen the righteous forsaken in their needs. He said, I have been young, now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. Somebody say amen right there. That's the God of provision. David said, I've been young, now I'm old, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. One of my favorite verses, I've got to give it to you because it just means so much to me when I think about this concept, and it's simply this, Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Now, I want you to think about the depth of this passage and what this means. Look at the scope of what this means. He, God, God, He who did not spare His own Son, Jesus, but delivered Him up for us all. Now, let's, let's just think for a moment, okay? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up, why? For us. 
Now here's Paul's reasoning. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Here's Paul's reasoning. If God would not hold, withhold Jesus, then logically and rationally, he's not going to withhold anything that's good for us. If God gave Jesus, that's the treasure of heaven. That's, that's the greatest gift there is. And so if God willingly gives the greatest gift possible, the very treasure of heaven itself, then let's just be honest and let's just admit he's not going to withhold anything good for, from us. There's so many people out there that talk about God being that killjoy that we talked about last week. But if he didn't spare the son for us, how much more is he going to provide for us? You may want to make a note of this. The, uh, in the Hebrew, well, linguistically, you know, we're going to refer to, to Jehovah or the Lord our shepherd as Jehovah Roy. And that's going to be R-O-I. I just want to make a, make a note of that. Jehovah Roy, what does that mean? It simply means that he is our shepherd. He can be fully trusted with every aspect of our lives. He is faithful. The righteous will not and have not and will not be forsaken. The shepherd, here's the beauty of it. You know, I mentioned earlier, the, the title of our message is, well, the title of our, our series is this. It's a calm from the psalm. But our title of our sermon today, our message today is this so sheep can see. Where would I get that from? Psalm 121, doesn't our Bible give it right to us? Psalm 121, our Bible says, He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. I know you know this, but, but you may want to copy these, these verses from Psalm 121 and put it by your bed. So that night, maybe, maybe you put it on your mirror before you brush your teeth. How many of you brush your teeth before you go to bed? Oh, hands up all over. Nobody's going to do it. Okay. All right, so right on your mirror maybe put this verse because there's going to be so many times when you get in front of that mirror and it's the closing minutes of the day. And all you're going to be thinking about is everything that went wrong and everything that you're carrying. And you're thinking to yourself, I'm not going to get any sleep. And then you read, read this verse, or these verses. And as you read these verses, be reminded that God's already going to be up all night. So why should you be? Because how many of you have ever accomplished anything by staying up and worrying all night? That one guy, he said, worrying works. I know it works because every time I worry, nothing ever happens. And a lot of times that's true. The thing you worry about don't happen. Now, it don't, it's not because you worried about it, though. But how about this? God's, God was up all night last night. And he's going to be up all night tonight. And he's up all night so his sheep can sleep. Can't you see that shepherd? He's out there in the middle of the wilderness. And you know what he does at night? He looks out for his sheep. They don't have a care. They don't have a worry because they've got a good shepherd. Notice how Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I'm not a bad shepherd. I'm a good shepherd. Because a good shepherd will do what? He'll even lay down his life for his sheep. Listen, tonight while I'm in my bed, I've got the good shepherd who laid down his life for me. And it doesn't matter what lion comes after me. He's going to say, uh-uh. Uh-uh, John's mine. I know him. He knows me. I laid down my life for him. 
And so John can sleep all night because I'm going to be up all night. And what am I doing while I'm up? I like, don't y'all like that song, Waymaker? Even when I don't see it, you're working, right? Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. I'm trying to find the tune, but it's not coming, all right? It's just not coming. You never stop, you never stop working, right? You never stop, you never stop working. I'm getting close. At least the words are right. Don't you love that song? He's my way maker. When I don't see it, he's working. When I'm asleep, he's working. When I don't feel it, he's working. Because he's up all night, and because he's up all night, John Bowman can sleep. I don't have to stay up worrying. I don't have to stay up fretting. I don't have to pace the floor. I don't have to wring my hands because I've got a shepherd. He's a good shepherd, and I shall not want. He's my protector. As we work through this psalm, we're going to see that so many, so many, so many times again where David said, the Lord is my shepherd. He is up. He is up all night, and I can sleep. He's the self-existent one. Listen, Jesus in several capacities said, I am You know, he said, I'm the bread of life, I'm the light of the world, I'm the door to the sheep, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the resurrection and the life, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, I'm the true vine. Jesus made it very clear, I am, I am, I am, not I was, not I will be, I am, I am, I am, I am self-existent, I am self-sufficient. What he's saying is he's saying, sheep, hear my voice, I'm enough. You don't need any more. I am am enough and no one else is enough one of the greatest things about our shepherd is he's not just a good shepherd he's the great shepherd he's a chief shepherd let's talk about the great shepherd though hebrews 13 let me leave you with this hebrews chapter 13 our bible says now may the god of peace who brought up our lord jesus christ from the dead here it is that great shepherd the good shepherd does what he lays down his life the great shepherd does what he gets up Somebody say amen. Yeah. The good shepherd does what? He lays down his life. The great shepherd does what? He gets up. The great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. Ladies and gentlemen, today he laid down his life. Because he laid down his life, I have nothing to fear. But he didn't just lay down his life. Our Bible says he got up. And so today... If you rejoice today that he's given his life for you and that he's took his life back, that we might have life, say amen. I don't know what you're going through. Uh, Some of you I do. Some of you I do. Some of you I don't. It's not necessary that I do. I'm the under-shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. He's the great shepherd. He is my shepherd. He is your shepherd if you're a believer. Now, there may be somebody here today and you say, Pastor John, I can't really say that he is my shepherd. Well, you know, that's part of the reason we're here today. The whole reason that Jesus came was to put to death your sin and my sin. That we might have eternal life. And I know the vast majority of the people I'm talking to, even live stream, you probably can say the Lord is my shepherd but if I'm talking to somebody this morning you say Pastor John I can't say that I want you to know this he did die for you he did raise for you and he does want to save you and have a personal relationship with you today everything that we've talked about today every everything that that encompasses what God is today as our shepherd he wants to be for you you say well I'm just not part of this I don't know don't worry about that just know you're part of the people that Jesus died for that's all you need to know all you need to know is that you're part of the group that Jesus died for and that he loves you and he wants to save you today if you'll trust him he will now for the rest of you say pastor John what what do we take away from this well I hope we're taking away a calmness I hope that we're walking out of here today calm you say well I watched Fox, Fox News this week that was your first mistake I watched CNN this week. That's even a worse mistake. Keep your face in the book. 
instead of looking at Facebook, put your face in the book. Right? You know, if many of us, if we'd have our face in his book as much as we have our face on Facebook, we'd probably be a whole lot better off. I mean, let's just be honest. There's not a whole lot on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook, but I hear about it from my wife and my mom. And I wouldn't say that, that they're, they're Facebook addicts, but they keep up kind of with what's going on. And, you know, a lot of what I hear, though, I'm like, I don't need to know that, don't want to know that, don't know why anybody else cares to know that. But if that's your thing, that's fine. I preached on that last week, so I'll get off of that and get on this. Facebook, nothing wrong with it in and of itself, but get your face in the book. And when you get your face in the book, you will find that the Lord your shepherd has a lot he wants to say, a lot he wants to do, and a calmness and a joy that he wants to give you that Facebook cannot and will not give you. I love today just knowing this. The Word of God is quick, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's my hope. It's my joy. And at the end of the day, it brings a calmness to me that Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat cannot bring to me. Spectrum can't offer it to me. He's offered me a calmness from this psalm. And it begins with this. Who is he? He's my shepherd. Lord, thank you so much today that you are my shepherd. It's not something you used to be. It's not something you're going to be. Lord, it's who you are now. Lord, I belong to you. And Lord, in a sense, you belong to me. Lord, today I know that I'm talking to people who are struggling. God, they've been through such tragedy and such trials. God, such, such uncertainty. God, this week they've spent time at your feet. Lord, they wonder, do you even care? God, God, just remind us that you care more than we could even begin to understand. God, your capability goes beyond our ability to even fathom. Lord, today, we, your character is, is, is epitomized by faithfulness. So, Lord, today, because of your character, and because of your capability, and because of your care, we petition heaven to our shepherd who is guiding us. We're just dumb sheep, Lord. We got no sense of direction. We can't take care of ourselves. We can't even take a breath without you. Lord, today we just present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. Lord, we're just going to follow you. We don't want to go astray. We want to follow you. God, we want to trust you with all our heart. Lean not into our own understanding and all our ways to acknowledge you as you direct our paths. So, God, we can't praise you enough. Lord, there may be somebody here today, God, you know. Somebody today that doesn't know you as Savior, God, would you save that soul today? God, save them from hell itself. Give them a relationship with you and an eternal existence with you in your house. God, that's what they want. Lord, help them to see that it's what they want, what they need. Lord, bring a calmness, bring a joy. Give us your fruit of the Spirit. Lord, as we lift up our voices, we lift up our voices in worship. God, we just ask that you would inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, we love you. We take a moment just before we sing with our heads bowed. Just take a moment of, of, of personal worship. Just, just right now, just, just Lord, I, I, I resubmit myself to you. I, I, I thank you for your sacrifice. I thank you, Lord, for your care. God, just continue to draw me closer to you. God, continue to bring me closer to you. And let's stand together. Let's sing together. This morning, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, every week I'm right here. Just come and say, I want to be saved this morning. I want to be saved. Lift up your voice, church.
Fill my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song. Sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. Here is my ebony. Hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good measure safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me with a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to from danger interposed his precious blood oh to grace how Great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, by my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to Seal it, seal it for thy course above. All else I adore your name. Above all else, to my heart to sing your praise.
great arrangement. Thank you so much. Jared, keep that mic. Keep that mic on, if you would, please. Hand it to Buddy Jenkins. Buddy, I want you to get, come and pray for us, if you would, please. Pastor Jared, if you'll come and make some announcements. Yes, so just wanted to uh, make sure that everybody that's participating in the bil biblical parenting class that takes place right after the service, uh, remember that you do not have to pick up your children from class. They will be taken uh, where they need to be for lunch and for the duration of the class. Um, we would ask that if you would stay in here for about the next 10 to 15 minutes while other parents are picking up their kids. Also tonight at 6 o'clock here, we are having a rally for uh, the See You at the Pole that's taking place on Wednesday. We've got about six or seven other churches in the county that are bringing uh, students and some others from their churches here uh, to just be able to pray tonight in preparation for Wednesday. Uh, we want to raise awareness. We want there to be good turnouts at the polls on Wednesday. Um, and most of all, we want to be praying that God will move. Um, so we invite everybody to, to participate in that. We do need a, about maybe four or five people who will be willing to help greet tonight um, that would just meet us back uh, probably about 530 um, in the Welcome Center area, and I'll assign you some places to go to help greet. So if you would be willing to do that, um, if you would, just see me right after the service. I'm going to be um, just right uh, back here where I sit in the back corner. So come see me if you'd be willing to do that or shoot me a text message. It would be a big help to us. Thank you, Pastor Jared. Buddy, you're going to have to come over here and stand, you know, for our live stream audience. I know you love that. I'll tell you something, last week I was standing right over here, and a little Benjamin Baldwin, he was, I looked up, you know how the kids run around here sometimes? I, I looked up, and Benjamin Baldwin was, was standing there just staring at me on the second row. You know, this was after church, and I was putting my stuff away in my bag. And I said, well, hey, Benjamin, how you doing? He said, I'm good. He just kept staring at me. I said, can I do something for you, Benjamin? He said, I heard all that you said this morning. I said, well, good, Benjamin. I said, I said what part did you hear? He said, it's just too much for my head. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I said, Benjamin, just hang in there. Maybe, maybe, you know, so if it was too much for your head this morning, I apologize, you know. Buddy, pray for us. And by the way, buddy, after this, after you say amen, you have something else you have to do. You have to say, you are sent. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the day. God, thank you for our church. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for a pastor that loves you and that you love him. Thank you for a pastor that preaches your word and, and tries his best to be a good pastor to us. God, thank you for being a great pastor. God, thank you for being the almighty pastor. God, we just ask that you continue to bless our church, continue to be with those that are hurting in our church, and Lord, just uh, just take care of them only like only you can. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you most of all for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You are sent. <laughs> Choir practice at 4 o'clock.